and people lifted up. In the second time. We have details as the EIU predicts a conditional win for President Kofado. Join us with your comments and there's and more on Newsnight. Also, UK Member of Parliament of Ghanaian descent, Belle Ribeiro Adi, talks racism, her work and life as MP and more. Situations you'll be in where you're questioned because of the way you look, not based on your qualifications, not based on your level of intelligence. So your work will be double checked. People will question some lines you put out. We have details of that interview on the Super Morning Show in sports. A board member of Accra Hearts of Folk has defended the sacking of Kim Grant after match day one of the Ghana Premier League. And in business, Nate assures the pension scheme is not under threat despite increasing the payment benefits by 11%. And in just a little over 24 hours, the official party to kickstart this decade, the Joy FM 90s Jam, will be underway at the Silver Star Towers here in Accra. And the Joy Newsroom have been practicing both their dance moves as well as lyrics from their favorite 90s songs. I don't want no scrubs. Scrub is a guy that can't get love from me. Hanging on the passing side of his. And to wait for the Joy FM 90s Jam, which is happening tomorrow at the Silver Star Tires. I'll give you details and more here on Newsnight. is brought to you by Puma Card from Puma Energy. Cash-free convenience. I am MFA Apao. Please join us with your thoughts and comments via WhatsApp. is 0244-340-437. Now, it was an ambitious quest to develop Ghana and to rival, if not to better Singapore. This is some 25 years ago, at the time of its inception. This dream seemed far off in the future. And we've just begun our journey into 2020. So we ask what happened to Vision 2020. In 1995, the NDC administration under President Jerry John Rawlins launched a Vision 2020 document that was put together by the National Development Planning Commission, NDPC, as Ghana blueprint for sustainable social economic development now i've been interacting with my colleague raymond Dakwa, and i first asked what the match talked about vision 2020 is all about so we called it the national development policy framework i.e we said for ourselves that between the years 1996 to 2020 we're going to achieve a certain level of development basically what we said we wanted was a balanced economy with a middle income country status and standard of living mm -hmm. that by the year 2020 we would have reached the level of singapore singapore and that's, that's what, what we're we looking at for ourselves yes mm. interesting but you know a bit about singapore though because uh, this is what we're setting to that's our target what do we know about singapore so we know that singapore had actually created an open and liberal market economy it was founded on competition initiative and creativity they employed science and technology in deriving what they call the maximum productivity of their people that is in terms of health social development in terms of economic development in terms of all the other facets of the living of the people they had improved from what used to be a backwater malaria infested state to a progressive one where the standards of living of the people had very much gone very high to the admiration of the entire world we also knew that their lifespan had projected big time so this was a state that nobody had hoping yet within the period that they went through their development phase they had actually advanced in ways that we wanted to copy them well we are in 2020 we would assess whether we are at that level where uh, singapore's level but by 2020 though what did we plan to achieve according to the document so we wanted a generation with a country with the people who had long healthy and what you call a productive life for all individuals and that we had access to enlarged sources and ranges for employment for shelter and also leisure we also wanted to have the benefits of development being distributed across the state in a way that both the seemingly poor and also the rich would benefit from the basic things that they needed we also wanted to bridge the poverty gap between the rich and the poor we wanted to at least reduce poverty to the barest minimum so we we'll have people having the basics of life and developing along the line we wanted to reduce population growth 
from what was the present level at the time of about 3% to 2% every single year. This is because we know that as of the time that we we're discussing that our population was not growing as fast or we needed to reduce it to levels that would be in tandem with the production in the economy. So one, social amenities are produced for a certain system, roads, schools, and all of that. You use population in doing the planning for these people. If your population is outgrowing your social amenities and the infrastructure, you always have pressure on this infrastructure. It destroys them, and people think that you've not done enough. So that's what we wanted to fix with that. And we wanted to provide solutions to our social, cultural, and economic problems together as a state, have the individual, the community, and the nation being at the center of it, and driving it all together. But how did we hope to achieve the targets that you've mentioned? So we wanted to create a robust, diversified, and what was called a commercially-based agricultural sector. We believe that at the point that we we're speaking about how to go by Vision 2020, we're still largely doing the hunting and gunning kind of agri. We are not expanded, and agribusiness was not at the forefront of our engagements. We wanted the agri sector to be the basis of production. So the food products, instead of taking them to abroad or other places, would find a place in the industry by growing the manufacturing base, building factories that can convert them to products, product that will sell at rates that will get profit from it for the state for individuals and this will provide jobs for the people this will also lead to transformation of cities and towns like mining did in some of the areas that we knew over the period of time so basically that's what we wanted to do with the idea that when we do sustainable development we will get to the point where people will be independent people will be able to live beyond what was the 54 average lifespan for the Ghanaian at the time but well, like um, we were discussing before uh, we, we, we had to talk, we, you were explaining to me that after this policy framework was put together, every government that has come along the line, because this was put together under the Rawlings regime, so every government that has come along the line have had to develop their own frameworks to fit into this vision. There is a long-term development framework, which was the Vision 2020. Each of the governments had their own plan as in a medium-term framework. Immediately, we put together Vision 2020. The first five years was for what was called the Coordinator Program of Economic and Social Development Policies. This was for the first five years. And what was it supposed to do? It was to ensure human development, economic growth, rural development, urban development, and provide an enabling environment for development. First five years, accelerated growth pushing up what was already done and this was between 1996 and 2000 was it achieved largely we tried making giant strides in the areas but when kufor came in we moved from that medium-term framework to what we called the growth and poverty first was ghana poverty reduction strategy one gprs one then we moved in the kufor second term to the growth and poverty reduction strategy gprs2 when Kufa was removed, the Mills administration also brought its own development plan. Virtually within the space, every government has sought to do a medium term to fit into the bigger brackets. One of the things we did very well at was the poverty reduction. The places we didn't do so well when came to social development, health, for example, we also did not achieve so much when it comes to the other sanitation related stuff. Water expansion and access we did well. It's the quality that's always been a problem when it comes to the area of water development. The other places that we thought we had done was rural and urban development. Do you know that within the same space, when we transitioned into 2006 going to 2011, by 2012, we had a larger section of our population, more than 50%, living in urban areas compared to those who are living in the rural areas, which was not the case before that particular time. Indeed, between 1992 and 2008, we had halved poverty, which was within the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals. It was to access to half poverty within a period. By 2006, we had already cleared that. We had halved poverty from what used to be 51% of the population being poor to less than 27 or so being poor. And over the period, we are seeking to work at that. When we transition into our current system, we have tried to take each of the sectors and work on. What we've not been able to do properly is to put all together in achieving the collective goal. As of 2013, government was reporting that we're a middle-income lower country. 
as in the vision of 2020 be middle income we are launched towards that direction by becoming a middle income lower country that had its own challenges when it comes to aid inflow but also had prospects that all the things we have done in the years before had 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 made us go in the direction that we're supposed to go so in all we have tried to achieve some of these sectoral targets just that Many believe that we are not where Singapore is today. That was the ultimate achievement. And we know that why we are not where Singapore is today. Well, so overall, uh, just before we wrap up, uh, you've talked about us attaining the lower middle income status as a country. But by 2020 also, is there anything else that we should be looking back on? You've talked about halving poverty as well and then becoming a lower middle income country. The, Any other significant thing? We had become middle income lower. What we have not achieved, which has worsened over the period, is the poverty variation, okay. or what we call the gap. The, the gap between the rich and the poor. So over the period, whilst we have reduced poverty largely, we have also increased the gap between the rich and the poor. Mm -hmm. We've not been able to do much in that direction. When it comes to actual delivery on sanitation, we've not done much on, on that. Environmental protection too, we've not really geared towards. So the health and sanitation areas, we've not done much, even with the MDGs, uh, what they call attainment. We did so well with primary education. We did so well with improving education access. But the bigger question has been the quality of the education we are delivering. So we touch on various parts, except that we need to develop in a more coordinated way to achieve the goals that we ought to achieve going forward. And again, even though between 20, 2008 to 2012, get it to 13, on the average, we're doing so well when it comes to um, GDP growth. We slumped from 2013 to 2016, falling below the average 8%. We have gotten back, if you check what's happening now, between 2017 to 2019, we are still averaging um, 6, 7, and 8%. For us to get where we want to get to, we need average 10% of GDP, which we've not achieved so far. So that's where we should be looking at going. So that's my colleague Raymond Aqua interacting with me there on the Vision 2020 document. I've been joined on the phone by the Vice President of the Coalition of NGOs in Water and Sanitation, Mr. Atahin. I'm grateful for your time here on Newsnight, Mr. Atahin. I must also wish you a, a happy new year, I should say. But I will be tackling the area of water expansion and access to portable water as well as um, sanitation with you in terms of the Vision 2020 document. First off, I would want to find out your assessment of where we are in terms of water expansion and access to portable water? Uh, thank you very much and many happy returns. Um, I followed your discussion with your colleague and I think that he made a very good analysis. When it comes to water, as a country, we have done quite well. And by 2015, we had already exceeded the Millennium Development Goal target, which was 76%. By 2015, we were already at 89% in terms of access to safe water. Of course, we should admit that there have been some regional variations. While some regions are doing very well, others are not doing too well. We also have issues with water quality. In fact, the multiple indicator cluster survey, which is conducted by the Ghana Statistical Service 2017-2018, indicates that five out of 10 point sources where we fetch, I mean, the boreholes and other water systems, I mean, are contaminated with E. coli, and that is no good news. And then 8 out of 10 household water is also contaminated with E. coli. In fact, when we talk about E. coli, we are basically talking about fecal contamination. And I think that this is where we need to focus on and address. When it comes to sanitation, I mean, obviously, we have done very, very poorly in terms of sanitation. And it's because we have not prioritized the subsector. We have not put in the necessary investments, the infrastructure, and we have not carried the citizens along. In fact, it will surprise you, I'm sure you are aware already, that as a country, only 21% of the population has access to improved sanitation. By improved sanitation, I'm only talking about access to toilet facilities. 22% of the population currently are practicing open defecation in Ghana. Ghana generates about 5 million tons of solid waste annually, out of which 1 million is 
made up of plastic waste. And only 2% of this plastic waste is recycled. Not good enough. And so no matter how you look at it, we haven't done well. When it comes to wash in schools, I mean water sanitation and hygiene in schools, um, 49% of all the busy schools that we have in Ghana do not have access to safe water, while 30% lack access to a toilet facility. So when children go to school, they don't have water to drink, they don't have toilet facilities, they have to make up excuses to go home, and you know the consequences. And so overall, I would say that as a country, we have done quite well in terms of access to safe water. We need to improve in terms of the disparities and also the water quality. But in terms of sanitation, we need to do something drastic. Mm. And that is why, as a coalition, we have proposed the establishment of the National Sanitation Authority mm -hmm. together with the National Sanitation Fund. And we are happy that government has said that it is going to establish it. I think when we do this, we should be able to have coordinated and comprehensive implementation of policies and strategies to improve sanitation. Well said, Mr. Tahin. I'm grateful for your time. He's the Vice President of Koniwa. So, talking about water and access to safe water, uh, we head to the Volta region town of Agogba, where finding portable water is a big struggle. Residents have for years, depending on dirty pools around the community for drinking water. They blame some common waterborne diseases in the area on their lack of access to these portable sources. The chief of the town, Togbe Kuje Adonchiri IV, is worried about the situation. Fred Duho was in the area and as far this report read to you. Ghana's quest to attain the Sustainable Development Goal 6, which focuses on provision of clean water and sanitation for all, will remain a mirage if communities such as Agogbe in the South Town district of the Volta region continue to drink from this water source. Over 12 communities within the Agogbe electoral area remain at risk of waterborne diseases while children and women are the most vulnerable. The assembly member for the Agogbe electoral area, Mensa Kuji, tells me if their representatives should get their priorities right, it will be possible for basic amenities such as water to be made available to all. Interestingly, our members of parliament are budgeting of over 400 million Ghana cities to purchase a bulletproof curtains for them. And if I compare this amount to the amount they will use to extend water to this community, I think our members of parliament are not setting their priorities right. Members of a community led by the Avafia of their clan of Tafle, traditional area, Togbe Kuje, Adontri, the Sith, have taken their destiny into their own hands to raise 500 hundred thousand cities to undertake a self-help project we have decided to raise funds so that place the old pipes that we use and uh, that is why we are now celebrating this uh, festival but the money we raised was not enough that's Fred Duho's report read to you. Now, police in the central region town of Abrobeano in Elmina have begun investigations into the death of a couple in the room shortly after a watch night service. The couple, together with their four children, reportedly attended the church service and returned home. But around 2 a.m., their six-year-old child woke up only to discover that her mother had been stabbed with a knife while her father was also hanging uh, from the ceiling of the room. Central region uh, correspondent Richard Kujonyako has been giving us details of that. But we can hear uh, from the Elmina District Police Commander DSP Ensia Anan. We had information that the couples were uh, dead, so we proceeded to the scene and as we said, we found a man hanging from the ceiling with a pieces of cloth and head cap. And the woman was also lying motionless on, on her bed. So we examined the body and we could see that there was some blood coming, there was some blood stains on the bed sheet and there was something coming from the nostrils. So we removed the body together with the husband and sent them to the police. Um, for now, we don't know exactly. For us, for the hanging man, we, we, we definitely know probably he hung himself. But the woman, we can't tell whether he was murdered by the husband or he also committed suicide. We are yet to do the prison for us to know the cause of death. So most of them were surprised because, uh, as, as, as the area, area said, the, 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 the couples are fight. They, they are not that extroverted type. They are fight always so very cool and crazy. So people are really shocked why. That is. For now, we don't have that suspicion because the, the door wasn't uh, open. It was a small girl, the daughter, who actually woke up and saw the, 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 uh, the father hanging and quickly came out. And when we, we only saw the, the little one, so we did some counseling for her and had it in, handed her over to the extended family members. The, the small girl is traumatized because uh, I believe. Uh, though you, you might have seen that before, 
And uh, it's quite easy to get uh, an adult. I believe we go through the same uh, trauma. It's really traumatizing. The electric company is really traumatizing. That's the Almina District Police Commander, DSP Insia. And now in the Savannah region, two persons have been confirmed dead at Nakura, a suburb of the northeast Gunja district, following renewed clashes over a piece of land between two neighboring communities, Kitura and Chogna. Atta Ambila, 34 years, and Alhassan Karim, 29, died before police in Salaga moved in to restore calm to the area. Reports indicate that the two rival chiefs, Chogna Ibrahim and Kitura Alhassan, have for some time now been battling over royalties for the disputed parcel of land. Police in the region say they are on a hunt for the killers. We hear from the Savannah police commander, but first listen to Charles Andara, a development worker in the area, describing how the situation is affecting them. It's sad, but uh, I think we as uh, this in social workers, what we will only seek the authorities to do is that uh, whatever differences that this our brothers are having, the appropriate authorities should at least come to their aid and other organizations, uh, conflict management organizations, try their possible best, come and then see how to resolve these issues. The others who lost their family are also angry. We are all human beings. Uh -huh. Losing uh, uh, this in a, a relative is not an easy thing. But then we only look for the future. We are looking for future development. What has transpired? At least their conflict uh, management uh, authorities, they will have their own ways of bringing these families, consoling these families, and then at the end of the day, we will have a very peaceful land as far as it is a new region, and then we are all seeking and praying for more development. Now, the Savannah Region Police Commander, DCOP, Enoch Bediako, has been giving an account of events. On the New Year Day, the police had information that there were some disturbances at a Mojipe village near Talaga in the central Gonja district. So police uh, moved to the scene and uh, on the spot investigation revealed that the chief of Pabu sent his messengers to some settlers at Mojipe to demand a royal. When the messengers go there, one Abdul Rama Bori threatened the messengers. So the messengers returned to the chief and gave him the information. Some youth of Babusi who became aggrieved went to Mojipe to find out why Abdul Rama behaved so. In the course of trying to settle the issue, confusion broke out, which resulted in the exchange of fire. And as a result of the fight, two people were killed. So when the police mobilized together with the military, went to the scene. Uh, the, the town had virtually been deserted by the inhabitants. Security, upon going around, saw the two male adult bodies in the town. Savannah Region Police Commander DCOP Enoch Bediako. Now, traditional authorities in the Ashanti region are accusing successive governments of sacrificing the region's development on the altar of politics. They are vowing to spearhead vigorous campaign to reverse the trend in 2020. Ban Tamahene, Bafo Asario Wusu Amankwetia the Sith, who is also War Marshal of the Ashanti Heniu Tunfose to the second, laments what he says is a total breakdown of law in Kumase. Ohiming Terrier has more in the following report. Sanitation remains one of the challenges facing Kumasi as hawkers take over the streets amid human and vehicular congestion in the city centre. Metal and wooden structures have also sprung up on pavements and other unauthorized places. Repeated attempts by city authorities to decongest the central business district have proved unsuccessful over the years. Bafo Uso Mankwetia blames the situation on relegation of chiefs to the background in city management. He also cites lack of political will by government to enforce the law for fear of losing elections. We have been besieged by filth and then the fact that when you come to Kwanzi for instance, every pavement is, has become you know, a shopping place. Everybody is selling on the pavement. You go to the markets, the markets are in, empty. And then you ask yourself that, where on earth that we have markets and that the traders are not prepared to go to the market, but they are, they are only prepared to sell on the pavement. We have engaged the authorities in Kumasi. The only way that this thing can be solved is that there must be some element of force. 
to ensure that people um, go by the bylaws and laws of this country. And any time we see that they, they are not prepared to do what will put things right. Because when you come to Kumasi, when they go to the market, or when they go anywhere and they're trying to put things, they tell them that next election, we will not vote for you. So because of that, you know, they stop whatever they are doing, and they go back to their offices and their barracks and whatever. We are saying that Kumasi belongs to us. So if they can't handle things like that, we, the chiefs, we want them to give it to us. According to Bant Mahine, the Asante Regional House of Chiefs, led by the Asante Hine, has already engaged political leadership over the matter. He says Nananum will now assume full charge to push for development in the region. There's a serious reverence for Otunfo Osetu II. Asante Hine. I don't think that any authority, whoever you are, can tell the people of Kumasi to go to sleep. But Otunfo can tell us to go to sleep and we all go to sleep. And if the politicians are failing in this regard, I think that the chiefs can fill the void. I believe that if we go out there and we call our people and we talk to them, they will do the right thing. We tell them to sleep at six and get up the following morning. They do it. That is how influential 24 is in our social life. So no citizen of Kumasi would want to be seen to be flouting the orders that come from Manchia. From Kumasi for Joy News, I'm Interia reporting. You're still listening to News Night here on Joy 99.7 FM. You can join us with your thoughts and comments via WhatsApp is 0244 340 Now, to be a leader of black descent in the United Kingdom requires some tough skin. One woman of Ghanaian descent, Belle Ribeiro Adi, has braced the odds and doing just that. She's now a member of parliament for the Labour Party. She says even with all her achievement, her qualification and intellect are sometimes questioned because of her background. Listen situations you'll be in where you're questioned because of the way you look not based on your qualifications not based on your level of intelligence because there are certain things that are expected so you, your work will be double checked people will question some lines you put out and people think that racism has gone away it hasn't mm. it's more subtle it's not that somebody's going to come and kick you in the head anymore and call you the n-word but they will treat you in a certain way to downgrade you for instance that diana Abbott is the most abused mp in the she UK. is the most abused they will send her horrible messages as has her chief of staff i have to deal with these things you know people sending death threats i think the worst for me was when we had blocked this particular person from sending us emails and they went to go and find my personal email address to send Diana death threat through my personal email address. So that's how much hatred and vitriol just by being a black woman and deciding to stand up. So it's enough to put anybody off. But the one thing that Diana's always taught me is that if we don't stand up, the bigots will always win. She's also been comparing her position as UK MP with a Ghanaian MP. It's been very interesting being here because everybody is, is quite respectful. I would say that they don't treat the MPs in the UK with as much respect. Mm. We definitely don't all get called honourable. Mm. In order to be called honourable or right honourable, well, right honourable, that is, you have to be a member of the Privy Council. But beyond that, outside, you are just an MP. We do not get an expensive car. In fact, members of parliament, in order to protect the environment and in order to show that they're not wasting government money, are expected to take the trotter -trot to work. We, you'll find us often on public transport. Some will ride their bikes to work. There are unfortunately slightly less airs and graces. If you do receive quite a lot of abuse, you can get a security payment and you are allowed to be taken to and from oh, work. Okay. Now, Belladi says her stance as a Christian, though it posed some hindrance, aided her victory in the elections to become MP. What I did find is that when I stated it, there was a tiny bit of backlash and I was a little bit taken aback because, you know, people want you to, they say, tell us who you are. And I I'm quite proudly tell people I'm a Christian. My faith actually informs my work as far as I'm concerned. And I've had to explain that doesn't mean that I am discriminating against any particular group. I'm just explaining to you that in my faith, uh, Jesus gave two final commandments. He said, love God above others. And he said, love people. And if you love people, you can fight for their rights, stand up against the injustices that they face and, you know, do everything you can in your mode of work. And in my mode of work, it's politics to create policies that benefit them. If that's not showing God's love, then I don't 
I don't know what it is. What's your stance on homosexuality? I'm saying, I mean, people should be free to do whatever it is that they want to do. You can't discriminate against people as a Christian. You are meant to love all people. So if you don't stand up for the rights of people that are being discriminated against in that way, that's unfair. Now, she's here in Ghana to visit family, but has also participated in the Year of Return activities and talks about the impact of the initiative. Done with the Year of Return, all of the high profile people have been coming over and using their influence to show that Ghana is open, to put Ghana on the map, to make it an interesting tourist destination, to show that if you wanted to move here and work, it would be an easy thing for you to do. And I'm really excited about how it's moving forward, but mm -hmm. we do have to continue it and we need to attract diaspora from all across the world. I was having a conversation with somebody yesterday about um, the positive impact that, you know, being in Ghana can can have on people and I think about in my own constituency and everywhere else where you've got issues of youth violence amongst young black mm -hmm. people and a lot of it is linked to socio-economic issues do you know what there are poor people in Ghana and they're not stabbing each other so we need to look at what other effects being of a lower socio-economic background is is having on youth in the UK and perhaps what a positive link with their countries of origin could have on so that's Bell Rivero Adi, a UK member of Parliament of Ghanaian descent, interacting with my colleague Daniel Datsi on the Super Morning Show. You're still listening to Newsnight. When we return after business in just a little over 24 hours, the official party to kickstart this decade is a Joy FM 90s jam. It will be underway at the Silver Star Towers here in Accra. And the Joy Newsroom have been practicing both their dance moves as well as lyrics from their favorite 90s songs. I don't want no scrubs. Scrub is a guy that can't get love from me. Hanging on the past in the side. Later also we'll talk about election 2020, the spiritual versus the scientific, as some prophets have already started predicting the winner of the December polls. Will the NDC win the next general election? You say this with 52.1%. This is the flag of MPP lifted up. Yes, MPP flag, In the second time. We have details as the EIU predicts a conditional win for President Ekofaro. Uh, you may want to join us with your thoughts and comments on this. We'll head to Takrade also on how indigents there are celebrating their own musicians. But it's time for business now. And George, we are face clearing his throat to deliver <laughs> just that. What's in business, George? Uh, if, uh, coming up in business, Nita assures the pension scheme would not be under threat despite increase in payment benefits by 11%. A new Isoko Index report forecasts prices of commodities are expected to be, remain fairly stable. That is this month. The business news on Newsnight is brought to you by MTN Business. Welcome to the new world of business kingdom books and stationery your number one stop shop for all your offers essentials and first national bank we are the bank that understands your business first national bank how can we help you Simple. If you say MTN Mumu, it you feel like very simple. This trip would be a genuine two hundred percent. Top up your airtime with your MTN Mumu wallet. A one a breakthrough in the pie. Enjoy two hundred percent bonus on any amount you recharge with your MTN Mumu. I'll meet you three times your recharge money. <laughs> you can't believe it, me boy. Dial star one seven zero hash to top up your credit and feel the two hundred percent essential. Okay, for what the bra? Then jump calculation the reality. No, ah, so me talk two Ghana cities. We are here. Two hundred percent. Some top five Ghana. We are here. Two hundred percent. Some top it twenty Ghana. We are here. Two hundred percent. Two hundred percent bonus. Bro. You feel it? Our Ghana's best network. Dial star one seven zero hash. Now go option seven. Now back at home. Now you claim you two hundred percent bonus. No, just momo it. We there for you everywhere you go. <laughs> Terms and conditions apply. As 2019 comes to a close and the festivities set in, we would like to thank you for partnering with us this year. In the world of First National Bank Ghana, your business is our business. And we trust that this last year has seen opportunities unlocked, 
innovation enabled, and growth gained. May 2020 hold even more for you. We look forward to sharing it with you. And so, a mindful, meaningful, and happy holiday to you. Best wishes, First National Bank, Ghana. facility with no interest charge, free delivery services, and our free consultation on setting up your office, Kingdom Books and Stationery is unmatched in our delivery of quality and affordable office essentials, equipment, and furniture. Experience world-class customer service in all our branches in Accra, Tema, Kumasi, Cape Coast, and Takwadi. Call us on 0302-764-101 or visit our website at www.kingdomgh.com. Kingdom Books and Stationery, your number one stop shop for all of its essentials and stationery. Terms and conditions apply. At the count of three, I want everybody in the place to be to make some noise if you're down with me. One, two, three. It's time to take you back to the 90s. It's time for the joy of the 90s jam. Over 10,000 watts of sound power. Blasting your favorite 90s hits. DJ Black, DJ Sammy Fawcett, and other guest DJs will blast you up this Friday, 3rd January 2020, at the rooftop of the Silver Star Tower Airport. Rick, 60 cities per person. Time is popping up at 9 p.m. Can you do the Hummer? Can you do the Running Man? Can you do the Buggle? The Joy FM 90s Gem, sponsored by Glyco, will cushion you for life. Aloma Bitters, by Tower Mineral Water, pure, rich, and natural. The Joy FM 90s Gem, this Friday, the fair gem of the year, 2020, rooftop of Silver Star. Well, I said all the must be running coming. Kind of a serious man for the dance and sing. I know the must be coming and let's have some steam. Mister, Mister. Do you know we can study anywhere, anytime, even in the comfort of our homes? Tune in to Joy Learning on your multi-TV Digibox every day at 6.30 a.m. and feel the classroom experience right at your doorstep. Here is our timetable. Catch up with us. The Form 1 Belt is on Monday to Friday at 7 a.m., 1 p.m. and 4.30 p.m. The Form 2 Belt is on Monday to Friday at 8.30 a.m. 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. The Form 3 Belt is on Monday to Friday at 10 a.m., 3 p.m. and 7.30 p.m. Catch up with Joy Learning for a recap on all the lessons on Saturdays and Sundays from 7 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. Learning is simple and easy on Ghana's first educational channel, Joy Learning. Joy Learning. Keep learning. You're welcome back to Business on Newsnight. Now, State Pension Trust Net says the pension scheme would not be under threat despite increasing the benefit uh, payment by 11%. Managers of the scheme today announced an increase of that monthly payment by this margin. Now, this should mean that about 70% of contributors could earn more than 70% uh, of this amount by going up by 11%. Now, those that had their benefits below 100 Ghana cities are going to be increased to up to 357 Ghana cities per month. Now, this increment actually presents a 19% jump over what they enjoyed in 2019. Let's hear from the Director General of the SNIT, that is Dr. Freighting Crane. The short answer is yes, because that is what it has to be, right? Uh, and that is why we are very judicious in how we uh, come up with these increases. Uh, we look at the long term sustainability of the scheme. Uh, to make sure that um, what we commit to pay, we are able to pay. That's why we are not indexing pensions by 100%. And so that's what I meant by partially funded. So what that means is that a lot of the, the current working population have to 
in a way subsidize a bit of the, the people on pen. So we have to make sure that we are growing the economy. The economy is growing so that uh, we can get more people onto the scheme. Okay, so you can get more collections. And then you have to make sure that, you know, you are running a tight ship, mm -hmm. so to speak, so that every city that comes in is judiciously looked after. And then, and then the, 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 the last thing is that you also have to make sure that the investments that you make uh, yield good value. Director General of the Securities and Exchange Commission, Dr. John Oforitin Krang. Meanwhile, a pensions expert and lecturer, Andrew Aglobi, believes that the trust could have done more by giving a higher margin and increment. So if we have data, you know, much data will explain why. Because surely the stability is key, uh, which I also share that uh, concern. Because if you look at some of these things that is happening now, last, before the end of last year, you consider there have been probably not let me say that the labor uh, union coming up uh, with me regarding uh, the past query, uh -huh, which is going to be another increment of when it comes to uh, the appeal, right? That's their outflow. Uh -huh. Then also, uh, when it comes to the other aspect of, and they are going to pay you any payment, it should be based on 24%, not 75% or 24%, which will roughly come around maybe. Uh, 35 percent, 24 percent will come around 20 or 21 percent, but they should pay 24 percent. So, surely, yes, their outflows are going to increase. And that was the pensions expert and lecturer Andrew Agblobi reacting to uh, the announcement by the Director General of Securities, that is the Social Security and National Insurance Trust, that is Dr. John Fulton Crank, about the 11 percent jump in the SNET payment to contributors. Let's move on to other stories. And commodity prices are expected to remain fairly stable this month. Now, that's according to the latest forecast by a commodity research firm, that is Isoko. The projection was captured in its latest index report for the month of December and November 2019. Content manager at Isoko Ghana, Francis J. Danso, has been explaining to Joy Business the basis of their projections. When you look at data over the years, you realize that between December and January, there are always price hikes. But for this particular year, you realize that the prices were declining. And so if you look at also the forecast in terms of what has been harvested, that is production, you realize that there are still some more commodities in the field out there that needs to be harvested and then brought onto the market. And so when you look at the price trends over the years and the fact that there are still some harvest to be done, we can um, conveniently say that prices are going to be stable instead of prices rising within January. Mr. Dote, how has, you've talked about a change in uh, trend or a change in something that happens usually. What has contributed to this? I mean, people are talking about planting for food and jobs and there have been so much produced. Has that also contributed to this change in trend that we would normally not see around this time? You cannot rule that one out. Um, because a lot of the farmers are on this program. And so you realize that um, in terms of their cost of production, because of the subsidies in there, it is uh, reducing the cost of production. And some of them have taken advantage to increase the acreage um, that they, they farm. And so you cannot rule that one out. But also you realize that for over a period, Consistently, too, there have been other commodities apart from the usual stable, the, the usual stable foods that are being produced, and that is also helping in stabilizing um, the prices. And that content manager, the so called Ghana, Francis Ajay Danso, they're explaining those on the stock exchange. Activities were fairly flat as no price or no stock actually witnessed any change in price at the end of trading today. And that's all for business <laughs> on news. Now, interesting you're talking about business in 2020. Exactly. When we were young mm -hmm. to see those billboards and I those commercials, and we never thought that we would grow up. I mean, we are kids. I mean, I'm a kid. You you know? are, I was not a kid. Okay. Master. I'm, I'm not saying <laughs> when it was lunch, but growing up, let me yeah, just say that, you course, know. But course. we thought that now we've, we've gone to, we've reached the 
there good. and then we'll see what will happen after that. But we'll that. see what happens. But Friday, we are, we are we're getting ready for 90s The 90s jam, jam is you know. going down. You see, we are I'm getting ready, ready. I'm our, ready since our bandana to pack, to pack <laughs> bandana because you know. Yeah. You know, she's been ready since the since. 80s. You know, <laughs> eh? She's been ready since, since the eighties. This is before the nineties came. Uh, I've also been ready past past <laughs> the eighties, before way before the eighties. Yeah, like why, why won't you be ready? <laughs> you know, so we're getting our bandanas ready for. You know, I told you I'm a crazy fan of Tupac. But you, know. you see, we're starting off from the stadium where Shatawale will be performing between mm. the game between Legon mm. Cities and then uh, what Kotoko. So the so, SMs will go there. Yeah. Oh, whether SM or not, we are making Ghana <laughs> football great okay, again. So okay. We all going bring there. back the love. Yes, bring back the love. And Benedict joins me in studio with latest from the world of sports. Yeah, it's, good, it's good that you talk about the Shatawali uh, performance uh, uh -huh. tomorrow. Yes, uh, because he has declared mm -hmm. that he is the number one fan of Legon City's football club. Do you follow them? What is it about Legon City? I, I, I don't. Uh, you don't. I'm a Kotoko fan and I won't okay. hide that. You no, know, so, it's just uh, about. Following them, we've heard about them, but I've not followed them. Good, either. I've not followed Legon. You're, City, you're so. a business guy. I'm a Legon, I'm a Legon, you know. You're a yeah. business guy. Mm. Please follow them. You uh -huh. see the branding, I the know. quality of things. Now, this is a campaign, right? Yeah, yeah. it's a campaign. It is for, for, for the no, because they are doing something good, they are mm. doing something great, and okay. it, it is worth okay. letting people know what wow. they are doing. Mm. Because you look at the branding, okay, they they, they signed Fatal Dauda, and you you check the pictures and how it was done. Have you seen their bus? Okay. No. You are Santa Cruz uh, fan. I'm a Cruz fan. Don't worry. The bus, the bus of a Santa Cruz doesn't even match don't that. Don't worry. Maybe I'm a Cruz. Have you seen Accra? 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 Have you seen Have you seen the bus that you know transported Karela to their first game? Mm -hmm. Sprinter. Don't worry. But go and look at Lego and see this football club. I'm a Cruz fan. Hard. And you know what? When you go on their Twitter handle, they are putting pretty much interviews today for the very first time okay some oh i'm coming mm -hmm. for the very first time in our league today they held a pre-match conference at the Accra Sports stadium wow. okay you understand with your coach and players there the rest should learn from them that's exactly so, so they are doing something, something, great. something great. Great. if we need and to Shata bring Wale, back the love yeah then this oh, the love there is coming back and since Shata, I'm, a, I'm a logo knight i'll consider Shata, Shata Wale, Shata Wale is performing uh tomorrow uh god willing during the asante kotoko game against legon city uh -huh. so that okay. game will be at 6 p.m <laughs> so we'll go to the Accra stadium right from, up, there, from the Accra stadium and then you know and you know it's between the two of us george afe when we get there don't come close you hear Maza, tell us what's <laughs> happening in the world of sports <laughs> all right so uh let's stay here on the local scene the quality of member dr nyahunya tamaklu has defended the sacking of coach kim grant after just a game in a premier league now the decision came to many as a surprise but dr nyahunya tamaklu believes they took the right decision a south african pilot has flown south african airways for more than 15 years without a certificate his mistake slightest mistake was the third when he was on the flight with germany when they went in they realized that the man had not got the necessary flight they immediately grounded him a different person took over the plane from germany back to johannesburg so when you detect the default of a professional person it could happen in a profession you take an action immediately so that is what the board what we saw at the stadium alarm all of us that we have to look at the problem facing the technical. Secondly, the coach, uh, these are some of the things that compel us to take certain decisions. So that's uh, Dr. Nyaho Nyaho Tamaklu, board member of Accra Hattifuk. There's a big game tonight in Liverpool. The leaders of the English Premier League, I nearly said champions. Yes, mm -hmm. they are the champions in the making. Uh, they come up against Sheffield at Anfield. That's your spot. Thank you very much, Benedict. Let's take some of your messages that you sent in. This one says, if you develop a plan, leaving out massive education in science and technology, and hunting some industrial entrepreneurs, then you will never make it. This one also says, Ghana wants to be like Singapore. Whoa, it's a laughable thought, he says. Singapore leaders are serious about their citizens and nation as a whole, whilst our leaders think of Toyota Land Cruisers and buying of big houses. Papa and Sa Teshi Nungwais to send that one in. And this one from Kofi Seidu says, there's a total breakdown of law across the country and the ban to Mahine is just spot on. And this one also says, what is wrong with us as a people? A number of Western world are shying away from facial recognition technology, yet we are going to spend huge sums of money to procure this system. Nana from Spintex Road says, our vision 2022 achievement, I think, is marketing, walking on pavement in our cities with pedestrians and vehicles competing on streets. Filth all over. I was shocked driving on the Medina High Road 
route or highway during the holiday. Uh, Komla would know that. And this one, I'll uh, take a final one. Thank God the EIU prediction of a co-founder being re-elected is based largely on macroeconomic indicators and other indicators not based on the honest responses of majority of our electorates. This one also says the defeat of the Ecofado will be the direct expression of the very poor results the Ecofado says he does not um, respect. Okay, I, I this one also uh, says Yao in Tema says bunch of uh, comedians these prophets of elections and that takes us to our next story the spiritual versus the scientific that is what is looking like as we begin the election year. At a crossover services um, to Russia in 2020 some notable prophets prophesied victory for President Ecofado with others predicting a win for John Mahama. Let's start with Prophet Nigel Gazi of the Prophetic Hill Chapel, who was emphatic that former President Mahama will win with 52.1%. The Lord told me that the NDC should plan and think now. The Lord said he has rejected this government. The Lord said he has rejected this government. The Lord said if the nation Ghana does not listen, we will go back into the days of 1983. 1983, I wasn't born. But the Lord told me that he has rejected this government. And if we don't listen, Ghana will go back into the dark days of 1983. In the history of Ghanaian politics, Ghana, your politics in the history of prophetism in Ghana, I don't think that God has given precedence to any prophets. I saw the NDC win the next general election with 52.1%. Now, the founder and leader of the Glorious Way Church, Reverend Emmanuel Bedu Kobi, and another prophet are all predicting a win for President Ekofado. But by the way, the elections of 2020 is already done on. Hey. It's, already, it's finished. Yeah. It's, and if you check how it was done, the ruling party won. I watched. I looked. In and I watched. Let me you. And the angel that descended came from heaven. And he whispered into my ears. And I saw the flag of MPP lifted up in the second time. And there's nothing nobody can do. Well, that is the spiritual aspect. Now, the Economic Intelligence Unit, in its latest uh, report, said it expects President Kofado and the NPP to secure re-election in 2020. Now, it further stated that if the NDC can present a coherent opposition and hold the NPP to account on an unfulfilled campaign promise, particularly on infrastructural development as well as private sector development, such as job creation and industrialization, uh, where progress has been generally slow and success patchy, the election could be closely contested. We've been speaking to some Ghanaians on what they make of these prophecies and projections. We've also been asking them whether it will influence their choice in the December polls. For me, I don't believe in those kind of prophecies, seriously, concerning elections. Elections are won based on the manifesto the party presents and what the people believe in it. So we have a lot of countless of uh, prophecy that have a lot of pastors said um, MPP is going, DC was going to win, whatever be the case, and it turned outside down. So for me, something relating to election prophecy, sometimes for me, I doubt, seriously, I doubt about it. But I believe in prophecies, but for election sake, I don't think so. Anything can happen. So I don't believe in prophecy and I don't begrudge any prophet bringing their stance as to who will win in 2020. Each and every individual has a political affiliate, like myself. I, I don't belong to, strictly belong to one political party. I just listen to their manifesto and look at who is possible can deliver. Then I vote for the person. I wasn't there when God showed the vision to them. I wasn't there. Uh, so what, what we can do from our side is, watch also also been, also been past prophecies and then find out how accurate it is and also watch prophet nigel's prophecies and find out how accurate it is is that, that anybody who has watched both of them will know that some some of them connect some of them are are hinting about this like the terrorist attack uh, nigel said we should watch from now to march 
um, also Ben Pai is saying you should not gather at uh, public places. So uh, it's a good thing for them. The, uh, on the elections, while both of them are uh, have diverse views, um, that one I, I don't have any excuse for it. Um, you know, it's God who speaks to them. So all what they are saying, I believe, can happen, depending on God's choice. What this man is saying and what the other man is saying, you and I cannot decide unless God says yes. But all just can just say, oh, this is what is going to happen. But mostly we just see something different. So all what they have said, they believe that's what God has just said. But naturally, it do change sometimes. Some of um, the views of uh, people we've spoken to on the scientific versus the spiritual when it comes to election 2020. Now at the pubs and in the restaurants, it is blasting loud in the speakers. It's arguably the official theme song for Christmas in the Western Region City of Chakrade. But as my colleagues Komla Adom and Mapita Sabidi report, there's more to this than meets the eye. In our Christmas in Tadi series today, we put the spotlight on one of such eateries where patrons are treated to 100% music by artists from the region. Let's find out why. Embedded among the thousands of fun having masqueraders through the market circle. You could easily forget you've not had lunch. And for foodies like myself, uh, Maps and Gomez, it was like we had not eaten for days. I probably was attracted to the aroma of food wafting from an eatery along the street. From outside, I can hear one of Kofi Kinata. In fact, I can hear Kofi Kinata's voice. Mm -hmm. I don't know which song it is. Let's just get in while we have our supper. We also, you know, get to experience the song that's been played. <laughs> So they are currently playing one of my favorite songs. I am just waiting for the, the favorite part, which is the food that I'm going to have. Hey, hey, hey. The food was good. But what was more intriguing for us was this. Right as you enter, you see his picture on the wall of fame. We can see Nelson Mandela. We can see um, Cristiano Ronaldo. You can also see Lionel Messi. And so Kofi Kinata joins an elite class of you know, personalities that have lined up in this particular restaurant. And it's, it's amazing. I mean, it's gratifying to see that they are sort of elevating one of their own, you know, that high. I, I also think it shows how much respect they have for him. This is not the first restaurant we've been since we touched down in the oil city. Gideon Safo Edu manages the Glimpse restaurant. He's our man. We like him as a person. He's sober and cool and he is always on point. So we like him. The strategy gets his restaurant appealing to many, many young people and the results are visible. We wish every day will be a day like this. In fact, business is booming. It's the peaceful atmosphere here and the music that's keeping us. At a time there are calls for a percentage of local content to be promoted. This could be an example. I, it's a good time that I was hoping we could speak to Kofi Kinata himself, but definitely I uh, will bring you that. But uh, just before we go, uh, before I tell you about the 90s jam, though, the Executive Council of the Ghana Football Association has appointed legal practitioner Prosper Harrisonado as General Secretary of the Ghana Football Association. And when your sports presenter gets overexcited, he forgets to tell us about that. Benedict Owusu uh, giving us that information. But... Here in the Joy Newsroom, we don't only do the news, we can also sing some of your favorite songs from the 90s as well. We're getting ready for the official party to kickstart this decade. It's a Joy FM 90s jam. It's happening tomorrow, tomorrow, just tomorrow at the Silver Star Towers. It's starting at 8 p.m. And of course, the tickets are going for just 60 Ghana CDs. Like I said, you can also go on our social media platforms and also use a short code and then get your tickets now. But I leave you with sounds from some of my colleagues rehearsing their dancing moves as well as uh, the lyrics of their favorite 90s song i am mfa Pao. there's more news when you log on to myjoyonline.com shortly also we'll cross over to star bite for the karaoke session with lexus bill and the team uh,